So okay. today um, we have Stefan Rotter, and um, he will have um, a talk about non-emission channels of invisibility across complex media. So Stefan, please go ahead. Okay, Andreas and Francisco, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to present this talk. Um, I also need to apologize. I'm not yet fully up to speed because I had a corona infection 10 days ago. So I'm still on the way back to recovery. So maybe it will be a little slower than usual today. Um, my internet connection is also not very stable. So may I ask everybody um, to turn off the camera and the microphone. This will save some bandwidth, I think. So welcome everybody. Thanks for being interested in this presentation. Um, I will give a talk about curious properties of waves, especially in the context of non-emission media. And uh, let's start with some very basic property of waves. So something that waves can do, of course, as you know, is they can interfere and they can produce actually wild interference patterns. This is something that you already see when you take a drop of water and you drop it in a Petri dish as shown here in a video that I took from YouTube. <laughs> but in fact, you don't even have to go to the dynamics of waves. You just have to take a laser and shine it onto a small particle. And what you will see is that you get interference patterns, speckle patterns, beautiful interference fringes that um, continue to fascinate us. But um, as beautiful as those patterns are, many people have thought about how to actually suppress wave interference. Why would you want to do that? Well, if you could suppress diffraction and interference, then you could make uh, this object here, for example, invisible, because if it doesn't scatter, you cannot see it. And of course, Think about fields like biomedical opti optics, where what you're trying to do is actually to see deep inside media that actually scatter a lot. So if you could suppress the scattering, then you could actually penetrate much deeper with visible light. So successful con uh, concepts to suppress interference have, for example, been uh, developed by uh, those two gentlemen and many others. Um, that followed the recipes of, of Leonhard and John Pendry, who, for example, tried to suppress the scattering of waves at an object by building a cloak around this object using uh, concepts from materials and transformation optics. We will try to do here something similar, but uh, again, different. So what we will be trying to do using non-emission physics is actually not to guide line around an object, but actually to guide it through the object. So if the object, for example, is this uh, obstacle here, a, a dielectric material that scatters waves in different directions, what we will be trying to do is to add something to this um, dielectric material such that the wave can just go through as if the object wasn't there and not around it, but actually really through it. Um, and the new ingredients that we will try to use to actually get there is gain and loss. Gain and loss are actually two uh, concepts that uh, have emerged as new uh, ingredients in optics. Uh, each one of them has already been studied a lot. For example, gain is the essential ingredient for building a laser. Whenever you try to amplify a light, then you need a gain material. Loss is present anywhere. Just think of this black paint here that absorbs light and you typically try to avoid it, of course. But the new ingredient that we will be trying to combine uh, the new ingredients that we will try to combine here is actually gain and loss in a um, specific combination. And why could this be interesting to the community here? Well, you know this already, because concepts like uh, parity time symmetry are actually concepts that um, when you translate them to photonics, combine gain and loss in this, um, in this new way. Um, 
Non-emission physics, of course, is a field that has developed over many years by, uh, and was developed by prominent authors that are also uh, present here today in this, uh, in this talk. Um, but about, um, uh, I would say, uh, 10 years ago, um, people have realized that such um, concepts that were studied, for example, in quantum mechanics um, and in high energy physics could actually make a useful contribution in optics and in photonics. Um, I am not able to list all the works that have been published since because there are hundreds of them. Let me just highlight maybe three review articles that summarize the exciting developments that um, have been taking place uh, recently. Okay, so let me start um, with the physics. Um, what we are trying to do is construct waves that don't scatter. So let's, um, let's start with the most simple uh, system that we can think of. Let's take a uh, one dimensional space and let's solve the Helmholtz equation for the uh, electric field component uh, psi, which is for example, one scalar component of the electric field in 1D. Um, and um, epsilon of course here is the dielectric function that is the square of the refractive index and k0 is the wave number at which, for example, an incoming wave can propagate through this dielectric landscape. And psi will then be the distribution of the electric field in this uh, scattering problem. So if we want to construct a wave that doesn't scatter, well, the most simple wave that doesn't scatter, this is a wave that we all know, that's a plane wave. A plane wave is a wave that just has a constant amplitude and a, um, a plane wave propagation e to the i k zero x. Um, and, uh, and this plane wave, of course, has also, when you take the absolute square of it, a constant intensity. So in, its intensity is constant uh, all over space. So it's, uh, it's the same everywhere. And our intuition tells us that plane waves, of course, only exist in free space or in homogeneous space. As soon as you put some kind of an obstacle into the path of this wave, then it will scatter and you will get interferences. And this in, these interferences will also, of course, lead to a variation of the intensity. This is what is shown here. I just uh, choose a refractive index distribution that consists of a few Gaussians. Um, here is the uh, real part of the refractive index. And if I come in with a wave from the left, it will scatter, it will be back reflected. The interference fringes are those that are shown here. Also, I, of course, do get variations in the intensity in the middle of the structure and then part of the wave will be transmitted, part of it will be reflected. And the problem that we would like to solve now is what is a possible distribution of gain and loss that could be entered or added a posteriori to the structure such that not only I get perfect transmission, meaning no reflection, but I also get a wave that doesn't scatter neither in the asymptotic regions nor, and this is the important aspect, nor inside of this region. So I get a constant intensity wave with an intensity that is really constant all over space. And of course, um, from the outset, it's not clear that such a solution exists, but as I will show you, uh, these solutions are indeed um, uh, constructible. And how are we going to get those solutions? Well, we just go back to our Helmholtz equation, and then we make an ansatz for a solution that is already of the form that uh, we have a constant intensity wave. So psi here is a is a constant uh, has an, a constant amplitude a, and again this plane wave type um, propagation where however now I put in an integral from some place to x and x is here the, the variable uh, at which the I evaluate the wave with a real um, function w that we will call generating function that is integrated uh, up to the point x. And of course I already see that 
if I take the absolute value squared of this wave, then it has constant intensity. So, um, and to get the recipe for which dielectric function epsilon gives rise to such a type of solution, all I have to do is put this solution in the equation and just solve for the dielectric function that I get out of it. And what I find is that the dielectric function epsilon of x that gives rise to such solutions has the very simple form w squared minus i over k0 w prime. Well, this is just a special derivative of this function. And the nice thing about this solution is that this is not just a very specific type of solution for one very, very special class uh, for, very, for one specific potential, but it's actually a solution for a whole class of potentials because I can choose W in whatever way I want, as long as it's continuous and the derivative is also continuous, then this will give me um, a whole class of potentials. But what I also see is that if W is real, and it has to be real, otherwise this is not a constant intensity wave, but then I will get a variation in the intensity. This prescription tells me that in the epsilon, I don't just have a real part, but I also have a, an imaginary part. And this imaginary part tells me that to get such type of solutions, I indeed require gain and loss to be added to the system. And as I said, this works for a very general class of Ws. In fact, such type of potentials, epsilon of x, have been introduced already earlier by a gentleman that uh, unfortunately passed away already, Mr. Vadati from Japan. He actually introduced this um, potential to construct parity time symmetric potentials because if W is a symmetric function in space, then this is a parity time symmetric potential. But in principle, uh, we didn't demand that W is symmetric, so I can choose W to be an arbitrary function. And then, of course, this will not be a parity time symmetric scattering problem. So, in, in other words, we use this in a more general context now. So let's see if this works. Here is again the um, the real refractive index that I showed you before. Excuse me, can I, could, I, could I interrupt you? Could I ask one question? Yes, absolutely. Uh, what happens with uh, unitarity in your system? I suppose because of the gain and loss, uh, you, the probability would not be concerned, but there must be some sort of unitarity. Have you examined this case or by modifying the psi or? Well, um, I agree with you that because uh, we have gain and loss, uh, the scattering matrix will not satisfy the uh, conventional um, That's right. unitarity condition, but I expect that there will be sort of a generalized uh, unitarity condition. Yes, I that's... think this generalized unitarity condition can even be worked out. Um, uh, and at least for the case that the system is parity time symmetric, I think um, you have this special feature that it's not S dagger S that is one, but is it's PTS PT that right. is equal to S minus one. That's right. It, is that this is sort of a, a a classical form of the C operator? That is, if you require that that you have conservation. Um, yes then this, this in, in effect, with no, this is not quantum mechanics at all, but this gives you a classical analog of, of C. So that tells you what CPT is and, right. and what the probability definition is. Yes. And then you can quantize the theory, of course. Of course in principle, yeah. In principle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK, thanks for the question. OK, so uh, here's the potential and the, and the wave that I already showed you before. Now, if I add the gain and loss, then indeed, and here is the gain and loss values that uh, result from our construction principle, then I indeed get uh, the wave that um, is not only perfectly transmitted, but that also shows no intensity variations. And you can nicely see that each hump in the potential uh, requires one gain loss hump uh, here, such that you have to think of it in such a way that Sort of when the wave comes, uh, usually it would be reflected, but due to the uh, 
the gain and the loss, the reflection will be cancelled and the reduced transmission will also be uh, taken care of by the loss and gain such that the wave um, stays constant in its, in its intensity. But the important feature is, uh, if we go back actually to our, our definition, we see that the, the, this special constant intensity wave has a phase evolution where the phase only goes forward as you go along the way. This means that not only is the wave perfectly transmitted from left to right, but also everywhere inside, this is a wave that is only moving to the right. So in other words, this is not an interference phenomenon where waves interfere a lot and then they establish this kind of constant intensity wave. But at each point in the structure, the wave is only moving to the right. Okay, so I could in principle also truncate the structure and continue the refractive index here. And then I would still get a constant intensity wave inside. So it's kind of a very special uh, solution. So um, let me also sort of um, show you how counterintuitive this is. Let's take a really very um, complex disordered structure in 1D. And of course, if I send in a wave from the left in such a complicated potential, then of course it will interfere wildly. There will be lots of interference fringes. And for those of you uh, who are interested in this, I will even get, for example, Anderson localization of this wave such that I have an exponential suppression of, um, of how the wave uh, is able to go to the other side. And what I will show you now is what happens if I add the corresponding gain and loss distribution to this medium according to our design principle, and I increase the amplitude of the gain and loss everywhere in the structure more and more until it reaches the level where um, where the, the wave is a constant intensity wave. And what you see is that if I add the gain and loss, the wave actually doesn't change dramatically. It just sort of reduces its interferences and it smoothly crosses over to the wave that actually has perfect transmission and no intensity variation. So it's a, it's a smooth crossover uh, that is induced here by the gain and loss that is added here um, to the structure. Just to be sure, this is not just a statistical gain and loss distribution, but each value of gain and loss here along the way has to be sort of matched to the real refractive index that is shown here. Just to be sure that sort of you cannot just add gain and loss in an arbitrary manner or with some statistical properties, but you really need to design it in, 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 in a way that is adapted to this potential. Okay, so uh, if now we have a wave that, um, that is perfectly transmitted and that doesn't scatter, the first question that you can ask is, does this wave actually, or is for this wave, the structure that we constructed actually invisible or not? And this um, brings me to the concept of unidirectional invisibility that was introduced in this context of parity time symmetric structures by uh, Christodoridis and company, uh, some Picos Cortos, Wei Zhao. Um, and they showed that by stacking gain and loss elements, they could make a structure unidirectional invisibility. Unidirectional in this context means that a wave has to come in from one specific side. If it comes in from the other side, the structure is not um, uh, invisible. They considered periodic arrangements. Our system, of course, is not periodic, but is it invisible or is it unidirectional invisible? And their answer is, well, uh, if you design it correctly, it is. And what's the relevant quantity to look at? Well, it turns out that to make a structure invisible, it means that it has to acquire the same transmission phase as when the wave transmits through empty space or through the background, the homogeneous background medium in which this whole structure sits. So in other words, what we need to demand is that this solution that we already have has the same transmission phase uh, and this is the transmission phase here, as when you propagate only through a background index of refraction N0. And this means if this transmission phase has to be the same, then this W function has to be N0 
plus another component, which needs to be zero if you integrate over it. So, because if f is larger than n zero, if is larger than zero, then you get a faster phase evolution, but then you need to compensate it with a smaller, with a slower phase evolution such that on average, you exactly get the phase evolution that you would also get in the homogeneous background. And if you demand that, meaning that the transmission phase is 2k zero L, which is the length of the structure times the refractive index there, then indeed this, um, the structure that you designed in that way should be invisible from one side. And this is what we showed in that paper. Um, and what we then studied was, is this property of invisibility something that only works at the design wave number K0, or is this something that has a broadband feature? Because this would be nice if it's broadband, of course, then you can even send pulses across the structure. And, um, and um, also for this pulse, the structure will be invisible. So we, we checked, for example, how much transmission do we get if we try to transmit the wave as a function of the wave number uh, across the emission system without gain and loss. And there you see that the transmission actually changes a lot. It fluctuates as a function of the wave number. Maybe I should use the laser pointer. But if we look at the system that we constructed and we constructed it at the design wave number K0, where the transmission is exactly one. And when we vary the wave number here, we see that we have a pretty broad and stable plateau of wave numbers where this concept seems to work. Just because it's not, as I already said before, because it's not a resonance phenomenon, but even if I have a little bit of detuning, it still seems to work. And if that's the case, this should mean that we have sort of a structure that has a broadband invisibility. And if uh, we have such a broadband invisibility, this means we should be able to send a pulse through it. And this is what is shown in this animation here. So we have on top here a emission system without gain and loss. Then here we have the constant intensity wave system with the adapted gain and loss. And in the bottom panel, I show you the uniform background uh, medium where there's no disorder at all. This is just the N0 medium that uh, that serves as the reference. And if uh, what um, I just told you is correct, then it should mean that if I send in a pulse from the left through the system, then this pulse should go through the non-emission um, constant intensity system in the same way as through the homogeneous system. So let's have a look. Okay. Please have a look at the pulses. Here you see that the pulse diffracts in the emission system due to the disorder, but in the constant intensity system and in the uniform system, I really see that the pulse is diffraction free, but it also arrives at the output at the same time as when it propagates through the uniform medium. So it means that indeed for this whole frequency range, on which the pulse is actually uh, living, uh, the structure is um, invisible, which is of course a really interesting feature if you think about it, that um, you can look through such a medium that would typically be opaque or completely reflecting without any, any back reflection or so. Um, Question, so, can I, yes. so how, how much of this depends on the um, real part of the refractive index that you begin with. Yes, so um, you can, you can, so th that's a very good question. And I guess it's from Ali, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, um, so the way you can, you design your constant intensity waves is that you, that you can say, okay, I start with some arbitrary, um, generating function w that i choose at will and from this i will get a real refractive a real part of the epsilon and an imaginary part of epsilon and if i propagate only through the real part of epsilon then i get the scattering but if i add the gain and loss then i get what i get but we have also shown that if you don't want to start with a um, 
uh, generating function w but let's say you have a real uh, part of epsilon already given because you have sort of a medium and you just want to add the gain and loss to it then uh, you can through an optimization algorithm also try to find the gain and loss distribution that is needed to make a, a, a real refractive index distribution a unidirectional invisible by adding the gain and loss in, in that way. So it means that yes, the gain and loss always needs to be adapted to the to the emission medium. And the easy way to, to get there is to start with some arbitrary generating function. And then this is always fulfilled because this is the defining equation. The more complicated, but of course also the more realistic way, if you already have a medium, then the, the task would be to find sort of a, a corresponding gain and loss distribution that fits to this part uh, to, to make the structure unidirectionally invisible. So if my I question look, is if I look at your pictures, I have the feeling this gain and loss is a derivative of your original structure somehow. Exactly. So this is also sort of part of the intuition. If the potential varies strongly in the real part, it also means that the derivative is very strong, which means you have to add a lot of gain and loss to compensate for it. Which also means that you will run into problems if, for example, you have a potential step, because if you have a step, then the derivative, the derivative will be infinite. And this would mean that you will have to add an infinite amount of gain and loss right at the step to actually uh, kill, the, to kill the reflection there. So in other words, the whole thing depends on the smoothness of your potential. The smoother your potential is in its real part, the less stringent is the requirement of adding gain and loss that you that you need to add to get this to work. And the more the sharper, of course, the the index varies in space, the more gain and loss you also need to add to to, to compensate for that. Stefan, could I ask a, a, a question? Sure. Um, yeah, it, it, th this is uh, this is really beautiful. Um, Thank you. But can I ask you? One might if one hadn't seen this before, one might expect that there's some sort of um, uh, uh, phase shift of some sort, but there isn't, okay? Um, that is the waves arrive at the same time, regardless of, of whether you have this gain and loss or not, right? But if you had a nonlinear equation instead of a linear equation, do you then develop some sort of um, phase shift if you tried to use the same idea? Well, I have to say that um, I can also, if I don't satisfy this requirement, this requirement that the integral over the W satisfies this requirement, then the phase shift is not the same. And then you get this additional phase. So what I'm trying to say is that this here is an additional constraint on the constant intensity wave. If you want it to be, um, uh, if you want the structure to be unidirectionally invisible on top of the fact that you already have a constant intensity wave. So this is sort of an additional requirement. But you're absolutely right. Um, you can also solve a, a nonlinear, for example, Schrodinger equation, or in optics, yeah. this would be the, the, the equation where you have a kernel nonlinearity. And this is actually what we did in, in the first paper already. And surprisingly, even if you have such a nonlinearity, such an ansatz with this W still works. Uh, and this is still an exact solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And then, of course, the nonlinearity uh, will also uh, give you an additional phase. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. We have another question in the chat by Bernhard Meister. Do you want to ask this question, Bernhard? <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, is the group velocity um, changeable? Um, <laughs> that's a difficult question because um, if we would first have to agree on what uh, what is the definition of the group velocity in a non-emission medium. <laughs> 
and uh, um, and uh, I know that there is a discussion about this problem and uh, the different degrees of sophistication with which you can address this problem uh, because uh, in anonymous medium it's not so obvious uh, you cannot just take sort of the conventional definition of the group velocity and apply it here. Uh, so um, the answer is I would have to discuss with you a sort of what kind of group velocity we agree on and then um, uh, what that would mean in the context of, uh, of, of this problem. But I cannot give you an answer just like that. So I cannot even <laughs> ask now, did it answer your question? Because it didn't, <laughs> sorry. But uh, uh, I don't know, we could, we could talk afterwards about it if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I saw the, the, the main idea would be, can we be faster than the speed of light, but uh, faster than even if there would be no, um, um, no, um, uh, if, if it would go through vacuum. Some, something like that, but I, I guess it's 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 definitely true. One has to be um, one has to be quite careful about the definitions. Well, there's a whole body of literature on this faster than the speed of light. Uh, also, when you tunnel through an, uh, a structure, and it gets even more complex if you add gain and loss. Uh, I can tell you, and uh, I've gone a little bit in this direction, but I, I saw that there's so much already there, um, and one has to be really careful. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, shall we continue? Um, uh, as you already see from the structure, I mean, adding gain and loss inside the material is of course something really complicated. You can in principle use a spatial light modulator and pump the structure, uh, an active photonic structure to have a certain gain loss distribution, but it's challenging. Uh, so in terms of an experimental realization, what we have been thinking about was um, a discrete structure. And um, the question we asked is, can we transfer this Helmholtz equation to sort of a discrete uh, equation that lives on discrete sites? Um, and the natural way to make this translation is to say, okay, the second derivative here is then translates into a finite difference derivative uh, and everything else is the same. Mm just that the Psi and the Epsilon are just defined on those discrete sites. And it turns out actually that if you do that, this ansatz with the W and the E to the I integral of W still works, only that the integral becomes a sum, but everything else stays the same. So you can directly translate this to the um, discrete domain. And then of course, if you, if you have a discrete system for which this constant intensity wave can work, you of course ask yourself, what would be a discrete system that can be engineered for which you can add gain and loss in a flexible way and for which also the discrete Hellman's equation holds? And the answer is you use an acoustic system because in acoustics, the acoustic wave equation is very similar to the Hellman's equation. And the discrete sides here would be then loudspeakers because loudspeakers naturally have gain and loss they actually amplify sound. So we approached um, our colleague Romain Fleury from the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne, who actually uh, worked already with um, acoustics. And what he did is actually to build a tube uh, where he had computer controlled loudspeakers. And, um, and we would then try to see whether our constant intensity wave concept could be implementable in, in, in this uh, acoustic system. And what he actually did first is he tuned the loudspeakers here. There were nine loudspeakers in this tube in such a way that in the first instance, those loudspeakers would just scatter, but no gain and loss would be present. And then he measured the pressure, the sound pressure in front of each loudspeaker. Uh, and here you can see the results. The, uh, the color rings and the bars are the experiment. The uh, black rings and bars are the theory, the numerical solutions. Um, and you see that the radius of the, those rings corresponds to the, the amplitude of the pressure and the bar corresponds to the, to the phase. And you see that the pressure varies from loudspeaker to loudspeaker. 
but still numerics and uh, experiment correspond very nicely to, to each other. And then we added to the loudspeakers the corresponding gain and loss distribution following from our recipe. And what you see is that the pressure now in front of each, each loudspeaker has the same amplitude and the phase uh, um, uh, varies. But uh, indeed, we could uh, realize in that way a constant pressure sound wave. So this is the acoustic analogon of um, what we derived originally in optics. And it worked really very nicely. And uh, due to the fact that uh, in acoustics, gain and loss can be really nicely controlled. OK. Um, another extension of this concept that we were thinking about is, does this also work not only if we have scattering in 1D, but if we actually solve the paroxial wave equation where the wave actually doesn't actually... Uh... Stefan, could, could I ask just before you go to this, yes. um, sure. what, you, what you did was, that, that's very interesting about discretizing the Helmholtz equation, but what you did in, dis, in discretizing it, you took the natural discrete form for the second derivative. But mm -hmm. for the no derivative term, all you did was to evaluate it at that point on the lattice. And that is not um, the only way to discretize. That's right. So what you did in the k naught squared term, the yeah. second term in the equation, is you simply you, you took psi and evaluated at that lattice point m. Yeah. But in fact, there are many ways to yeah, discretize. Right. And there are, uh, if you discretize not by putting psi at m, but averaging it at, at two steps, two nearby psi steps. Psi m plus one plus psi m minus one divided by two, for instance. Exactly. Yeah. And the advantage of doing that is that in many discretizations, that actually, this goes back to Nick's question, it conserves probability. It has all kinds of um, advantages that okay. this, this straightforward discretization that you use okay. um, does not okay. have. Yeah, in the, indeed, that's a very valid point. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Look, uh, um, that's that's a very um, uh, good comment, and um, uh, I can see that uh, for different ways of discretizing this, you can find uh, solutions that may work for this specific type of discretization. Absolutely, but I think that the way of discretization that we used here. Um, uh, is the one that can most easily be transferred onto the acoustic system. But it may very well be that if we choose a different discretization, then we could also find then a corresponding analogon in the experiment. And then we would find a corresponding solution to that discretization there too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But since sort of with this most simple form, it already gave uh, very nice results. And by the way, not just numerical results, but if you enter the ansatz with the sum into this equation, you will find that this gives you an, an, an analytically exact solution of the problem. Um, we were already satisfied, but of course, there are many more ways in which uh, this could be extended, absolutely. Thanks, Carl, for the question. OK, so um, we also asked the question, can this be generalized to the paroxial wave equation, where the wave actually propagates in z direction, and the potential varies in x direction, uh, which corresponds to the sort of analogon of the Schrodinger equation, where the time derivative is replaced by z here. Um, and also for that case, this concept works very nicely. Um, we showed uh, in, in that paper here that um, uh, if, you, if this is the real part of the potential and this is the imaginary part with gain and loss, then if the wave doesn't come in with the right uh, amplitude and phase distribution, and here is actually this potential around zero that, that goes all the way back here, then you get lots of diffraction. But if you inject the wave with the, with the correct amplitude and phase onto this potential that also uh, satisfies this equation with the W squared, et cetera, then you will find the wave that has a constant intensity. So here's constant. 
only due to the fact that the wave has a finite extent. So we already considered a realistic situation that the wave is not infinitely extended because then it would be an exact solution, but we truncate the wave. We see that this constant intensity feature only survives for some propagation distance. And if the aperture is wider, then the constant intensity feature survives for deeper penetration depth set. This is something that people in optics already know from vessel beams. Uh, the wider the beam is, the more it will sort of survive and keep its uh, defining features. And we find the same thing here. Uh, this also works, by the way, with paroxysmal in 1 plus 2D. So we inject here a beam into a, into a system that has a gain loss patterning. And also this beam propagates in that direction and, um, and its finite aperture with a constant intensity in the middle survives for some propagation distance. Only later it breaks up um, because the beam only has a finite extent and then sort of at some point this, this will break down. But uh, we could show that sort of also such extensions actually work. So now com comes the interesting question. And this is the actually the, the main part of my talk now. Uh, can this concept also be extended to real 2D scattering problems where you're not in the proxial approximation, but sort of where a wave can come in and it, and it can scatter the potential in all directions, for example, in 2D? Can you add a gain and loss distribution to this potential such that you suppress scattering and you make this structure invisible. So to get there, what did we what did we do? Okay, we first looked at, of course, the Helmholtz equation uh, that uh, you need to solve for the 2D scattering problem. And it looks like this. And um, we already saw before that these constant intensity waves that we found, they behave like, um, uh, plane waves in 1D, only that their phase evolution is different. So what we did to actually find um, solutions that don't scatter also in 2D is to say, okay, let's try to find the corresponding plane wave or free space solution in 2D. So we solve the Helmholtz equation, not in the presence of a potential a non-trivial potential epsilon, but for the case of a homogeneous background medium, NREF, and this NREF also shows up here in the top. So the NREF is the homogeneous background and only on top of this sits some non-trivial epsilon. And let's assume we know the free space solution because for example, let's take a Gaussian beam that goes through free space and we know what the solution for phi is. Then, if we want to find a potential epsilon for which this Gaussian beam also goes through the structure like a Gaussian beam without scattering, what can we demand? Well, we can demand that those two solutions, phi for free space and E for the uh, inhomogeneous uh, space, that they are not the same, but their intensity is the same. So we demand that the intensity of E and phi are the same, which results in the equation that E and phi are related to each other by a phase shift that is of course dependent on space through this function theta that depends on X and Y. And now comes the really uh, cool thing. If you add or if you enter this simple relation into the top equation and you assume that you know the solution for phi, then this helps you and you will find the defining equation for the epsilon for which the E will exactly have the same intensity as the free space phi that you already found before. And this is now an equation that uh, should remind you of something. Here is a term that is uh, nabla theta squared. So this is like the W squared. And here you have a nabla theta again with the derivative. So this is the W prime. So we find again the same sort of form, a W square and a W prime as in 1D, 
but there's now an additional term that I will explain later. And for those potentials, we should find that um, the, 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 the desired solutions. Of course, I can also do it the other way around. Instead of starting with a given distribution of uh, theta that I choose, I can also say, okay, uh, if like in uh, the real world, I have a given dioptic function and it's a real part, and I know what the solution in free space is phi and its phase, then I can calculate the corresponding gain loss distribution by solving this differential equation. So I can do it both ways. Okay, but let's not um, dwell too much here in the, uh, in, the, in the equations. Let's have a look at uh, what this means. Okay, so let's consider a potential, just a refractive index distribution that has this bipolar shape as an example, a very simple example. And let's assume a wave comes in from the left. If I, this wave is a Gaussian beam and I have an obstacle, then of course it will diffract and it will scatter. There will be a huge peak there um, and there will be a strong variation. If I now follow the design principle from above and I add gain and loss, then, and the gain and loss distribution for this real distribution looks like this, then I find that this Gaussian beam actually propagates through the structure, through this non-hermitian structure without any scattering. You see the white rectangle here is the region where this potential actually lives. Outside of this region, we have just homogeneous space. So you see that indeed, I've managed to design a potential in such a way that a Gaussian beam goes right through. And this doesn't just work for the simple potential, but it also works for an extremely complicated potential like this complex disordered medium. If I send in a Gaussian beam in here from the left, well, I get lots of interference fringes, speckle patterns, scattering in all directions. And Following our design principle, if I add the corresponding gain and loss distribution where gain and loss are shown here in blue and red, then I will find that the same Gaussian beam that I inject here goes through like through butter without any, any scattering uh, and, uh, and interference fringes. So um, is this then a structure that is invisible? And the answer to this is actually very easy because if you look at again at the um, connection between E and phi, so the electric field in the medium and in free space, then those two are connected through, through this phase shift. And if the structure is, is invisible, it would have to mean that E and phi have no phase shift with respect to each other outside of the structure. So it means that the that, that function theta that I have here just has to be zero outside of this structure. And if that's the case, then it, then it means that, well, the E and the phi, they may have differences in the phase inside of the structure, in the real and in, in its imaginary part, for instance. But if outside of the structure, they have no phase difference, then this structure will be unidirectionally invisible for this beam that comes in from the left and that, um, that um, that uh, satisfies this equation. So in other words, I get the invisibility also here sort of uh, directly uh, by just demanding that this theta function that I introduced earlier uh, just is zero outside of the um, uh, potential region. And uh, also here we checked of course, whether um, this is a robust phenomenon and believe me, I will just uh, skip through this briefly, that also here, sort of this is a, a, a broadband feature such that also in that case, we should be able to send pulses through this medium that actually propagate through the system. But since those numerical calculations are quite, quite hard to do, um, I cannot show you a corresponding um, animation. We just checked explicitly that this broadband feature is indeed satisfied. Another aspect that we checked is, Let's assume you design a medium uh, through our design principle here in this, um, in this square, and you design it for a beam that comes in at zero angle, a Gaussian beam that comes in at zero angle. And then you ask yourself, what if I detune my incoming beam by a, a small tilt, for example, 0 0.5 degree, does this still work? Because 
the whole design is bound to the specific incoming beam for which you design the structure. If you design it for a, a beam that has alpha equals zero, and then you send in a beam that's slightly tilted, well, then it may not work anymore. And what we see is that small tilt angles um, uh, are okay. So you see it's not perfect, but it's almost perfect. But if the angle is, for example, already four degrees, then the whole thing doesn't work anymore. But of course, if you tilt your angle by whatever degrees you, you want, you can always redesign your structure such that it will then let a beam with 0 0.5 degree or with four degree pass without scattering. But you then need to redesign your non-emission medium uh, to, to um, be adapted to just the right incoming beam that in that case, for example, has four degrees or 0 0.5 degrees. Um, at the end of my talk, um, I will also maybe um, uh, talk a little bit about connections of those results that I presented you to uh, works by other people. So one paper that I want to highlight is this paper from a Korean group. They showed in their official letter from 2018 that using Bohmian mechanics and the corresponding, corresponding quantum Hamilton Jacobi equation, they could set up potentials in which the phase and the amplitude of a wave could be designed independently. And they found that if they design a wave for which the amplitude stays constant, then they get a dialectic function that has the following form apart from this term that that I was showing you just before. And what's the reason for that? The reason for that is that this term here vanishes if you come in with a plane wave that has the same amplitude everywhere. So they found already that sort of for plane waves, how this concept works. But what we showed with this work is that how to get this to work for arbitrary incoming beams, for example, a Gaussian beam. And then of course the beam shape enters through the phi, which is the solution in free space. Yeah, and we checked that, uh, we checked this explicitly. So if, for example, our Gaussian beam is sent through a structure that is designed without this additional term, and the beam is very narrow, then you see that uh, it doesn't work. But if the beam is very broad and very close to a plane wave, because it's broader than the whole structure, then this term here becomes negligible and it also works if you neglect this term, okay? Then the, I also want to highlight that there are several interesting connections to um, other people's work. First of all, there's a large body of work by Ali Mustafa Sadeh and he also reported on this in the seminar on unidirectional invisibility and also a broadband feature. Uh, of this, we looked into that and it seems to be in some way different I haven't figured out yet in which way we can make the connection, but this is something that uh, I would be happy to discuss with Ali at some point to see what kind of a connection exists between his work uh, and what we did here. Then um, uh, there's an interesting connection to supersymmetry. You wouldn't believe it, but it turns out that um, there is in high energy physics uh, this concept of SUSY or supersymmetry, um, where you have a, um, a supersymmetric generating function that uh, generates Hamiltonians that, um, that come in pairs. And those Hamiltonians, they have the same eigenvalues apart from the ground state. And it turns out that Actually, if you look at the defining equation of the superpotential in supersymmetry, it has the same structure as our constant intensity waves with this W squared and the W prime, uh, such that one can say that um, the dielectric function for, the, uh, for our uh, constant intensity waves uh, correspond to the superpotential in supersymmetry, provided that um, the superpotential is purely imaginary. So we haven't understood yet what's the deeper reason for this, but my feeling is that there is still something very deep to understand uh, why this works. Maybe some of you have an idea why. Then 
There is an interesting work by Simon Horsley that I want to highlight. He points out that um, also in higher energy physics, if you look at the Dirac equation, then there are special modes at zero energy, the so-called jakeef rebbe modes that have a topological origin. And he shows that if you write down the, uh, the Maxwell equations in a Dirac form, then the analogy of the jakeef rebbe modes in, in the Dirac equation are exactly the constant intensity waves that uh, I was discussing here. And they seem to have even a topological or origin uh, um, and he also shows that um, sort of depending on the specific type of topology, you can get states that are either perfectly transmitted or that are lasing states or that are perfectly absorbed states. And this is actually something also that um, Dimitri uh, Tsetsulin and Vladimir Konotop understood because they found, this is also really interesting, that um, every complex potential that uh, either corresponds to a lasing solution, a perfectly absorbed solution, or a perfectly transmitted solution, forcibly has the form of this um, constant intensity Vadati potential that I was showing you here. So apparently this seems to be a very deep <laughs> uh, concept that uh, once you've understood it, it seems to pop up uh, everywhere you look. So I expect that there will be um, many interesting connections uh, still to be explored. Okay, so I think um, I've come to the end of my time, right? Um, Andreas, uh, I think I should probably finish, right? So I will... Just finish it, just finish it. You have a bit more time if you want to wrap it up. Okay, so um, maybe just very briefly, um, we also uh, have a recent work on encircling exceptional points, a work that we did with um, Nimrod Moseyev and Alexei Malibayev. Uh, and you may know about this work with the waveguides. And we could recently show that encircling of an exceptional point is equivalent to the concept of rapid adiabatic passage. Um, just by adding a non-hermitian component to it. So if you have a wrap protocol that leads you through a diabolic point and you add gain and loss to it, then the diabolic point splits up into two exceptional points and then everything stays the same, only that you encircle an exceptional point. And this is also something that we verified in the experiment, by the way, here's the reference uh, in waveguides where we took waveguides without gain and loss that have this conventional emission transition. And when you add gain and loss, then you get this chiral transmission. This is probably too fast, but uh, I just wanted to highlight it in case somebody is interested and wants to check the reference. Together with um, um, Alex from my group and people from the group of Mercedes Kajavikan and Dimitri Christolidis, we could also show recently that you can actually encircle an exception point in the laser that this laser can emit in one or the other mode on the two different sides based on this concept of encircling an exceptional point. For those of you who are interested in uh, PT symmetry of quantum systems, there's a very recent work that I want to highlight in which we show how to properly define parity time symmetry breaking in open quantum systems based on the, uh, um, the Lee Willian operator. So in case you're interested, please have a look. This was just published last week. Okay, with this, let me just summarize. Typically in optics, if you send a light through an inhomogeneous structure, you get intensity variations and interferences. But if you add the uh, right amount of gain and loss, then you can manage to get a wave with the special feature of having a constant intensity. Uh, this concept is very versatile. It works in 1D, 2D paraxial, 2D Helmholtz discrete and nonlinear systems. Um, I've presented you briefly an acoustic realization of this idea. And uh, in 2D, I showed you that with the right design, you can actually create channels of invisibility through such structures. Now, most importantly, I want to highlight the people who have been involved in this. Costas Macris has been a driving force uh, of this project. Um, uh, he was a postdoc in Vienna for two years with a Marie Curie Fellowship. 
Andre, Ivor, and Philip um, worked on this expensively. Andre just got his PhD. Ivor worked heavily on the 2D system and contributed a lot there. Um, Dimitri and Ziad uh, were involved in the very beginning of this project. These are the people from APFL around Romain Fleury who did the acoustic experiment. Um, the pin circling was done by those people here. Nimrod, um, Ulrich Kuhl, Alexei Malibayev, and uh, Peter Abel and my group. And these were the people involved in the laser work that I briefly touched upon in, in the end. Okay, here are the references, only very briefly in case this talk will be made available. And last but not least, I want to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you. Should we unmute ourselves and just give Stefan a hand and say thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listening. Questions? There's one again in the chat. Well, Bernard Meister, do you want to ask the question? Just unmute yourself and ask the uh, question. Sure. So um, what is the magnitude of gain and loss compared to the magnitude of the medium? Is there some kind of relationship? Um, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, uh, actually, do you still see my slides? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, we do. OK, mm -hmm. very good. So. Uh, uh, as I mentioned briefly before, the amount of gain and loss that is needed, um, uh, maybe I should, uh, I should probably do this like this. Okay, so here is the design principle. Uh, and you see, um, this is the, 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 the design principle for those structures. And you see that um, uh, the imaginary part, the gain and loss, uh, depends on the derivative of this W. So in other words, if the W, the generating function is very smooth, then you will get a very smooth distribution uh, both in the real part. So it means that the real part of the refractive index will be rather smooth. And because if it's smooth, then the derivative will also be very small. Then the imaginary part will be comparatively small. But if, however, you have a strongly fluctuating function of W that sort of fluctuates between large values, in other words, a very strongly scattering medium, then of course the imaginary component that you need in order to compensate for this strong scattering will also be very large. And it will be, of course, prohibitively large if the, the variation is too strong. In other words, uh, you will not be able to find the gain and loss distribution for a piece of sugar, such that you add the gain and loss to this piece of sugar and the piece of sugar will become transparent because the scattering will be so strong and the gain and loss will have to be adapted so uh, in such small detail um, that you will not be able to, to, to accomplish that with um, realistic gain values that you have available in the experiment. But if the variation is comparatively smooth, um, then uh, this is something that can be done. And in the discrete setting, of course, um, there's no problem at all. And in the same way that if the variation is very large, then the range of K zero the range around K0, which is stable, um, becomes smaller. Um, I would expect exactly that if, if the variation in the W is very strong, then the broad band, broad band feature of this will probably be reduced, yes. But uh, as we showed um, down there, um, on the slides, uh, even for rather strongly varying um, um, gain and loss distributions, uh, it's still uh, surprisingly broadband. And this is because it's not an interference phenomenon. That's, that's the important point, I think. Thanks, you. Thank you.
Thank you. Duncan. Yeah, so I, I was wondering um, if there is a connection to the adiabatic theorem or adiabatic principle. In yes, there is. <laughs> There is actually, and uh, you can very nicely show this. So uh, you can also arrive at this um, defining principle if you say, okay, I want, typically what you would do in a type of a semi-classical approximation is, for example, you, you would do a WKB approximation, so a semi-classical approximation of your wave. And if you demand from your potential that the first order WKB approximation is already the exact solution, so there will be no higher corrections, then you can use this as a way to derive this potential. Yeah, this is exactly the WKB formula, right? For the exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in other words, this potential is a potential for which the WKB approximation is exact. Aha, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I mean, if, if one had a, a periodic medium, no, you know, um, real refractive index and so on, um, and, and you want to pass a wave through it, you one way to do it might be to try and um, adiabatically evolve your incoming wave onto one of the eigenfunctions of, of the medium, mm -hmm. then propagate in one of those eigenfunctions, then at the other end, adiabatically go back to the, the plane wave. Is there anything? Is, I mean, have you tried expanding your wave function inside the medium in terms of the eigenmodes of the medium and see how the, <coughs> the probabilities to be in the different levels or the, the amplitudes to be in the different levels? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, that, that's also a very good question. So uh, what I can tell you is that if you expand this wave in the eigenstates of the medium, then you will find that the scattering wave function that we show here corresponds exactly to one eigenstate of the medium, provided that you solve for the eigenstates of the medium with the perfect transmission boundary conditions. Meaning on the left, you only have an incoming plane wave. On the right, you only have an outgoing plane wave. And if these are the non-hermitian boundary conditions that you apply to your um, to your um, uh, to your um, eigenvalue problem, then you will find that this scattering state corresponds exactly to one of those eigenstates of such a non-hermitian um, um, eigenvalue problem. Mm, because it is a perfectly transmitting wave, it's perfectly transmitting, and this means that the boundary condition on the left must be dx psi equal minus i k psi. And on the right, it must be dx psi equal i k psi. And this would be um, then um, the corresponding um, uh, 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 eigen, uh, boundary conditions that you would have to apply in order to map the scattering problem exactly on, an, on a corresponding um, uh, eigenvalue problem. Okay, thank you. When I look at your uh, acoustic wave propagation uh, uh, experiment, maybe should you should connect also to these astrophysicists who build uh, big telescopes with mirrors and try to compensate the uh, air pressure fluctuations by adjusting the mirrors uh, in time. Yeah, <laughs> they, they have these. Uh, many uh, mirrors and uh, try to get good pictures by uh, compensating the different uh, air pressures uh, which are passed through the light uh, by the light by adjusting somehow the mirrors uh, to yeah. get somehow a, a compensating mirror and maybe so the mathematics is very similar to, to you you have this uh, this um, um, the electric function uh, and uh, add gain and loss, and they have the fluctuating air pressure, uh, and they have to adjust their mirrors yeah, to get a good picture. Yeah. I mean, the that's a very good suggestion. The problem is that the people in what you what is called conventionally adaptive optics, where they have those mirrors, they are already pretty advanced. I mean, they can 
they can tune their mirrors for the telescopes on a kilohertz uh, time scale. So they, they have already a technology that works extremely well to keep a, a star in focus. They can do this thousand frames per second. And, and as far as I understand it, the light that is distorted by the atmosphere is just distorted in its um, face front. It's not distorted so much in terms of back reflection or scattering. It's just that the incoming wave front is distorted. And such a distortion in the wave front can be very efficiently uh, compensated by those, um, by, those, um, by those mirrors, uh, by those flexible membranes. That but maybe the mathematics in, uh, of the response of the mirrors may be similar to that what you are having here when you calculate your Gain and loss correction. Point, yes. Mm -hmm. That could. Uh, uh, I'll have a look at this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Any more questions? Should we then uh, thank Stefan again? I uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for coming, day. despite being still a little bit ill. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.